Our next presenter is John Kostick, who's the lead software developer at the Center for Clinical Innovation at the University of Rochester, with another very similar, but uh, from a completely different side of the uh, healthcare world story. John Kostick, please welcome him. Thank you. Take it away. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and a little perspective on where the story starts and who, who the we were at that point. So three years ago, I worked for a supermarket. The best supermarket in the world, I believe, but it, it was a supermarket. So I, I never expected to be here today or ever. And I'm, I'm honored. Thank you again. And so the we three years ago was a small family living in rural upstate New York. A simple life and really everything I ever wanted. My amazing wife, Laura, who had saved me 15 years before and to this day still gives me butterflies at the thought of her. And my darling, compassionate little girl, Sarah, and the little guy, Evan. So when, when as, as parents know, when your children are, are born, you're flooded with this emotion, love. And from what I can tell, Sarah and Evan have given me a gift. And my job as their father is to hopefully repay this gift. I'm in their debt. I've never known love like that. But what, what do you do when the people you love need something? What do you do when life changes? When your children get sick, they're sad, they're scared. What do you do when you notice an unquenchable thirst, constant sweating, a need to use the bathroom all, all the time? What you notice is something, is something is wrong. You call the doctor, and hopefully they recognize these symptoms for what they are. Unfortunately, doctors still miss this, and it's a simple test, a single drop of blood, a urine test which gave the doctors enough information to send Evan and Laura off to the emergency room. So that night, we would get confirmation of that diagnosis that, that Evan has type 1 diabetes. So that day in August 2012, I learned that type 1 is an autoimmune disease. It was robbing Evan of the ability to create enough insulin to pull the sugar from his blood into the cells and give him the energy he needed to live. And if that blood sugar stays high for too long, it, it can be fatal. If it stays high for too long, too frequently, over great periods of time, it can lead to debilitating complications. And what happens if you give him too much insulin and his blood sugar plummets and goes too low? He could have a seizure or worse, it, 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 can be, it can be fatal. So these were the harsh lessons we learned that day. And along with a three-day boot camp where we learned how to do the finger checks, how to count carbohydrates, and how to inject insulin. You do all this on this emotional roller coaster. It's an insane ride. And, it's hard, it's hard to even recall those days. They're sort of just this, this blur of emotion filtered through tears, anger, all those, all those things you experience through the grieving process. And then you do finally get sent home. And what do you learn? You learn that type 1 diabetes is immensely complex. And it's constant that the control you want to get in that nice range to keep your son healthy is, is very elusive. And the reason for that is there are so many factors. 22, I've noticed maybe 30 for Evan. Some 
with varying degrees of, of, of influence. And some of these factors can move the blood sugar in either direction depending on, on what, how the wind is blowing or what muscle groups did he exercise in gym class today. So many things. So you're constantly chasing these blood sugars. And it adds hundreds of tasks to your life every day. And you can perform those tasks identically and perfectly every day, and you're still not guaranteed any level of success. And you're not guaranteed that what worked for you today is going to work for you tomorrow. So in the beginning, what, what tools did, did Laura and I have to help keep Evan healthy? We had a paper logbook, the blood glucose meters, and disposable syringes and pen needles, rapid insulins, long-acting insulins. And these, these worked. They allowed us to bring Evan home and, and sort of come to terms with our new normal, but Laura and I, we're both engineers by trade, and we recognized that each of these actions, each of, using any of these tools, generates a lot of data, data that is lost inherently because there's no unified system to collect it. So the first thing we did was create a simple care portal where we could log blood glucose data, insulin dosing data, and the nutrition data for every meal, everything. So we took that data and we were able to analyze it and improve Evan's outcomes. We had a better handle on what his insulin sensitivities were and it allowed us to get at that elusive, accurate insulin dosing. But again, it would still change frequently and it's all a function of time of day and it, it still required us getting up multiple times a night. So we said, look, there's got to be some other technology out there that, that can get us ahead and maybe improve our quality, quality of life, right? So we went looking, and this was 2012, and these were a few of the, the devices we found. So an insulin pump, it's great, gives you very precise dosing, and removes the need for multiple daily injections, right? You could have an infusion site that we replace every three days, a lot more comfortable for you know, a four-year-old. And we also have a couple continuous glucose monitors on the market at that time. And Laura and I, we, we were very interested in, in CGMs from the beginning because we recognized that you get a data point every five minutes and we love data and what we could do with that data for Evan. But we also noticed that those technologies didn't look anything like the technology we had in our pocket, anything else in the consumer market. And we were willing to deal with it as long as those devices met the need of caring for Evan. And really, what we did notice was that pager I used to wear in 1998, something 15 years ago, looks remarkably similar to the diabetes technology at that time. We were due for some good luck, and fortunately, Dexcom, one of the CGM manufacturers, had a new product approved by the FDA shortly after Evan's diagnosis. This is the Dexcom G4. So we wanted this immediately. We didn't get it immediately. We waited a few months, and in February 2013, we finally had it in our hands. What we noticed was this, this, this second order data, the, the direction and the speed that his blood glucose was traveling gave us another dimension to work on and allowed us to really tighten up what was going on between the meals where we had no data before. But we also noticed that something was still missing, right? This device wirelessly communicates. I can get a hold of anybody. I can send anybody whatever data that's operating on some level of open standards, right? This device did not have, has a USB connection. That's, that's it. It couldn't wirelessly communicate with anything. But still, it was good. It allowed Laura and I probably our first full night's sleep in six months. But it still nagged me that, that why, why can't they give us a standard? 
and even the data when I pull it into their Windows only application isn't something that I'm intended or allowed to necessarily work with. It's Dexcom's format. So I got impatient, so impatient that within days of having the CGM, I decided to snoop around Dexcom's program files and see, is there anything hiding in there that would let me do what I really want to do with this, which is to liberate that data? And oh, wouldn't it be awesome if, by the way, I could get that data in real time, no matter where Evan was? So day four of our ownership of that CGM, we had a Windows laptop uploading Evan's data to that same care portal, that same database that we were loading his finger checks, his insulin dosing, and nutrition data. And it was awesome. And we sent this laptop to daycare with him. And the nurse loved it. We gave the nurse a website where she could view that data all day. And my wife and I had iPhone apps that we could view it on, and eventually smartwatches that make it even more convenient, glanceable. But Evan would go out to play. He'd go for walks. And then I'm not going to strap a laptop to a four-year-old. So in my mind, I thought, OK, there's got to be a way to move this functionality onto this device, right? A smartphone, I mean, all the interfaces are there. If I can figure out how that USB communication is working and what that information is laid out like, if I can decode that, I can build this tool for my family. So by May, mid-May, that same year, finally had a couple of weeks off from work, I decided to do even more work. But I did figure it out through whatever combination of skills I had acquired through my career. I'd never thought this was something I could do but I knew I had to. This was a tool we needed. I wanted Evan to be able to go outside and play without me bugging him every how many minutes for a finger check or worrying that he's just going to go low and not feel it and have a seizure out there or he's going to sit high for hours and I wouldn't know. So this gave us this ability and it, and it changed our lives nearly immediately. And I was excited, so I decided to show off maybe a little bit and tweet, look what I did. And this got a few people's attention. And, and the first person to reach out to me was Lane Desborough, another diabetes parent in search of a similar solution. He wanted to share the Android uploader. His need was to extend his son's receiver information into he and his wife's bedroom. I shared the Windows uploader because the Android uploader was relatively new and unstable. And with that, he built Night Scout, which is an amazing piece of technology, quite honestly. It gave this shared situational awareness to his entire family so they could assist their son so that his son knew how he was doing. And these blue dots here were his own prediction of where he thought his son's blood sugar was trending to. And over the next summer of 2013, he would draft Ross Naylor, another software engineer, to help him. I would refine the Android uploader and share that with him. He would share his charting code with me. And by the start of kindergarten, we had this awesome system, this care portal where the nurse could log this data and also observe his blood glucose through the day. My wife and I could look at it on our watches, and we had some of, some of this normal life back. And it gave Evan freedom we didn't think he would probably ever have had otherwise. So I used an Android phone for a very specific reason. And as much as I like Apple products, they're not open, per se. You have to buy in to use their, their frameworks and their libraries, whereas the Android, I could, I could get their development tools, write the code I needed, buy a $3 cable, and connect these devices. And Lane, 
also recognized this and used open source libraries and tools to build Night Scout. And this would in turn in inspire me to say, okay, you want Night Scout to be open source, you can, you can put that and the Android uploader in that package. Let's go for it. So in the beginning of 2014, that code became open and other diabetes parents and individuals began to scratch at it. And one of those individuals is a man named Jason Adams, another diabetes parent looking to improve their life, his life for his daughter and for his family. And he founded a Facebook group, CGM in the Cloud. And his goal was to help other individuals get through this, what was then a tr very tricky process of getting the system up and running. And the more people that saw this, the more people joined the group, and we gained developers to refine the code, individuals volunteering time to document the process. And incredibly, there's, there's a 24-7 volunteer support staff. And if you go into this group and ask a question, you, if you have to wait a minute or two at most to get responses, that's a lot. I was amazed by this group when it was 300 strong. And today, it's, it's over 14,000 members strong. And Night Scout is, is all over the world. Now, this sort of thing doesn't really go unnoticed. The FDA noticed. Dexcom may have noticed, but stayed quiet. And when the FDA came calling and asking, is this safe? What's the, what's the risk involved here? I said, type one is all risk. It's, it's really hard. There aren't many medications they give you and don't tell you how much to actually give somebody. You have to calculate it on the fly. And it's a very deadly medication, right? Insulin is very potent. There was much greater risk in not doing this. And we all understand, anybody that knows type one understands that things fail. Pumps fail, syringes break. You drop a vial of insulin, you always have a backup. This remote monitoring system just moves the front line for these individuals, for parents like me. And yeah, sometimes you have to fall back. Sometimes the internet isn't working. Cell networks go down, Wi-Fi breaks. But we know this is what we've been dealing with. We know how to fall back. The Wall Street Journal also noticed Evan making his front page debut. And to the FDA's credit, they, they recognized what this group was and what Night Scout is. It is parents, individuals crying out for something they need. This is a tool that changes lives. Imagine your two-year-old is diagnosed with type one. 10 years pass, and you start using Night Scout. What, what freedoms does that enable for you as a parent or a caregiver for that child? Does that kid go on their first sleepover? Do those parents go on their first vacation or even date since diagnosis? You can go into that group and see these tales, and it's immensely gratifying, and, and people noticed. So much so that within 20 days or so of that article, Dexcom's remote monitoring system, their first version, was approved. It wasn't a mobile system. It had to be tethered. But it was good for overnights. It gave people some awareness, even when they were traveling, maybe, of their kid and how they were doing, or a loved one, how they were doing at nighttime. But it was, it's not lost on me that the photo for this article is actually Evan's particular version of Night Scout, not the Dexcom share. But fortunately, within six months, Dexcom would have a truly mobile solution on the market. And this, 
I can only guess, is much sooner than they originally planned. I don't think they planned to obsolete a product within six months. And today, with a reclassification of those devices, Medtronic and Dexcom are both shipping systems whose primary intent is to enable remote monitoring. So. So did Night Scout have something to do with that? Maybe, maybe, maybe. But, but as far as I can tell, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, it's just important that these patients and these families have these tools now. They can decide for themselves. Do, they, do these improve your life? Do they make you healthier? Make your child healthier? And, and, and for us, they, they clearly did. So today, the we and we are not waiting is a community of diabetes parents, caregivers, and individuals. And we know now that we can do what needs to be done now. If we're capable, we can do it now. We don't have, have to wait. We can act now to redu reduce the burden of type 1 and hopefully improve outcomes, help our children live longer until that cure finally arrives. So what do you do when someone you love needs you? You don't wait. You do whatever you can to help them. So make life better for the people you love. And who knows? It may enable many others to do the same. Thank you. What has this taught you about your own concept of health, personally? Oh, goodness. For you. <laughs> that it's a challenge to balance everything and control your health in a way that, that brings you on the upside of that. That I think I've been so focused on type 1 in particular, on Evan, that maybe me personally, I've neglected some aspects but it's only shown me how important they are, right, and that I can't. You know, uh, one of the great questions that we got on Yorn, which was for Marv, but it actually uh, applies to what you were talking about here. Who came up with the words patient engagement? And, and I'm sensitive to the issue of, you know, too much jargon at conferences like this, overuse of the word engagement. Do people outside the medical community understand what we're talking about? Do you go home and tell your family, let's engage in healthcare? Really? Some rational pushback there, but what would you say is the day-to-day -day reality of this idea of engagement? The reality is patients are going to do what they need to do to survive, right? You have cases like this where the engagement spreads and it becomes obvious that there's an unmet need. The engagement needs, needs to be something that can be bridged with clinicians and the healthcare establishment. So hopefully this is just an example of, of where we can bring that. What's the bridge between this uh, motivation of patients and families and communities to survive with a healthcare community which in good faith actually wants people to survive and wants people to do well and you know would love to connect with the very people that you're working with, even though this feels a little bit more like an insurgency. Right. But nobody in this group, and I certainly would never turn anyone away. We would love to collaborate, and whether we know we are or, not, or we realize it or not, we are collaborating. This group is open. The code's open. Any of these device makers can, can look at what we've done and, and probably get a lot of free market research. But we're always willing to engage with providers and, and device makers. It's just a matter of making those communications safe. There's always some legal question. Like, can we talk to these Night Scout folks? They hacked our system. They're dangerous. They're doing things that are very risky and sort of 
outside the norm, right? And today, I don't have a good answer on what the FDA and how they, sh how they can handle, you know, a crowdsourced worldwide project like this. But, but it, it begs for continued conversation. Do you think, and this is the sort of business question, uh, can you monetize this sense of crowdsourced health? If a bunch of people were actively involved in the health of their own community and were collecting data, and that data was available, and they were willing to share it in return for some benefit that they would get from a healthcare institution, do you think it's monetizable? Do you think there's an economic question there that could sustain everybody? That's a question that we haven't answered yet, and it's something... It's the that, economic school at University of Rochester. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Business school. It's, yeah, and Night Scout, there is a nonprofit organization. There's some question, how could we sustain you know, a, a hosted service for folks to use freely or buy into? And you, you need a decent business, business plan, but yeah, it's, it's not a... I don't, I don't know. It's not, it's not easy, but we're right at the beginning of this potential collaboration. And John, thanks so much. That was Thank terrific. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.